Okay, so uh, thanks for coming and uh, seeing my talk on uh, Azure Service Bus. Um, the subtitle is not to sixteen under an hour. Um, whether whether we'll get there in, in under an hour or not, I'm not sure, but it'll be there or then about. Um, that's me. Um, a while ago, I wrote a, a book on on C Sharp Eight and .NET Core Three. Um, so it'd be uh, Appreciate it if uh, if you all go out and buy that. It's uh, it's definitely still in date. Um, you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and I also run a, a group of my own uh, called Mini Hack. Um, so it'd be great to see you all there. Okay, I'm going to do some live demos in uh, in this uh, in this presentation. Um, there's lots of reasons that you shouldn't do live demos in a presentation. Um, they're dangerous. Things go wrong, um, so I'd ask that everybody just pretends that everything works, and uh, and we'll never mention it again. Um, one of the things that um, I've I've done, I don't know if uh, if the guys have shared it out. I put a little uh, link to a direct poll in the in the chat. Um, so what I've got is a result page of that. So that seems to be working, uh, or at least some people have uh, have got that. Good. Okay, we'll be back to that later. Uh, cool. Okay. Um, so, as your service boss, I wanted to just sort of start off by having a quick disclaimer. Um, I'm I'm not trying to say that as your service boss is um, is like the the solution to every problem that you'll ever come across. Um, not. You know, not not even the the, the best or, or uh, you know, for 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 most solutions, it might be a much simpler option. Um, but it is a useful tool. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, there's there's usually no wrong way of using these things. Um, and certainly with Azure, if you've got the money, then you can kind of make it work for any anything you want. Um, so all I'm doing here is kind of explaining. Um. How how you can use the tool and what what you might want to use it for, but you know, there's there's no sort of right way. Okay, so um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what a, a modern system looks like, um, and that there's various different components in a modern system. Um, you, know, you might be using sort of service oriented architecture. Uh, you might have microservices. You might have some APIs web front end maybe some desktop apps and um, maybe even a mobile app but ultimately i think most architectural designs boil down to this um box box cylinder um i, I kind of stole that from a talk sort of a while back but essentially i think you know it, when, when you start actually boiling down architectural designs they always end up looking like this and there's nothing wrong with this it's, it's worked for ages um there's you know, I think I think probably seventy percent of systems out there are working fine, and, and they've got this exact model. Um, so I suppose I should probably explain the kind of problems that I'm trying to solve, or you know, that we collectively are trying to solve as an industry. Um, so that there's essentially falls into two categories. One is is communication, um, and the other one is load. Um, so the communication. Um, with with the sort of box box cylinder model, you can end up with uh, logical coupling, and you can end up with what's called temporal coupling between services. And obviously, with system load, you know, you, you, the worst thing that can happen is is that the user kind of has a poor result um, because because the system slows down. And um, so, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about um, coupling and. Uh, and Kind of what what we mean by coupling um, in a real world scenario, um, and I wanted to use this man to explain it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump to the next uh, question on that poll. I don't know if anybody recognises that man. Um, let's see if anybody does. Oh yeah, okay. A few people recognise him.
Cool. Okay. Um, people who guess Walter White were actually um, correct, or you know, this is obviously not not him. It's just a, an outline. But um, so, so he's engaged in a particular business, and he um, he sort of has a product that he produces, um, and that product is quite a valuable product, and uh, and he gets money from producing that product. And that money goes directly back to him. That's tight coupling. Um, he, he, you know, if if you were um, somebody who wanted to investigate, um, you know how how he was producing that product and so on, um, you know, you might go and have a look at the money, um, and then you might trace it directly back to him. Um, so, so what Walter needs in this situation is is a bit more loose coupling. Um, so you know, I don't know whether anyone's seen the program that I'm talking about here, but essentially the the way that he achieves this in the program, and I think you know he's not the only person who's uh, that this isn't the first time this idea has been has been brought uh, has been used. Is um, he, he kind of produces this this product which which generates money. Um, and then money comes in from other places, um, and and then this goes into um, a business, a legitimate business, and then the money comes back to him from that legitimate business. You can think of this business as a service bus or a message broker, if you like. So you've got messages going in from there and there, and then coming out. But at no point is um, is there any direct sort of call, if you like, from. Uh, from from the money to uh, to Walter, our friend. Okay, so <clears throat> if we uh, sort of stop talking about films for a minute and or series and and start uh, talking about actual um, tech, then uh, I suppose you know the typical logical coupling is this: you've got service one and it just calls service two. Um, the problem here is that service one needs to know what service two is um so for example you know if it's a rest or a soap service or whatever um it must know where it is so you know the the, the actual web address um and it to some extent or to quite a large extent it needs to know what it what it does uh so you know real real world example of this you know you might have a, a sort of um crm backend and and that might call a customer service. Um, maybe that creates a customer. And, uh, and and there's some kind of payload here, which which returns and says, "Yep, yeah, I've created that customer successfully," which which is fine. Um, but then, what happens if uh, if we end up with a situation here where somebody goes in and says, "Okay, well, we don't, you know, we don't need that opening balance anymore. Or changing the spelling of that." Um, or whatever it is, that custom service could uh, could potentially break or throw an error, and that takes out the calling service as well. Temporal coupling is a bit different. So with temporal coupling, that's uh, that's related to the the sequence of execution. Um, so here, for example, you've got service one call service two, um, and then you know it. It might execute a method, and then it calls it again and execute another method. Um, so if if service one needs to know the, uh, the the order in which those those methods have to be called, that's temporally coupled. Um, again, with our example, you, know, you got CRM backend calls a customer service, um, maybe create the address, and then create the customer. So in this case, you know. It, you can't create a customer unless you kind of know the address, uh, unless the address has been created beforehand. And then if we just move on to, to system load, um, so you know here we've got. So this is just a busy, trying to indicate a busy uh, traffic service, um, and uh, you know essentially if if that's being called too frequently, then service two. You know, it, it might start timing out, even if it doesn't, you know, buckle under the load. It, it might just become slow, and um, and then you might get a timeout from the 
the calling service. Um, and then a similar sort of thing is true of the, the user interface that we spoke about. Um, so, for example, you know, here you've got a service two that's potentially got a, an unstable or slow, in, uh, slow connection to the database or whatever it is. Um, that replies to service one, but it's too late. Um, you know, this might be a user trying to place an order. Um, maybe this is just doing a start check, um, but it's uh, you know it times out, and then and then the user potentially gets a timeout, or they, they just close the page because it's just cycling. So obviously, the answer to this, given that the title of this talk is uh, is uh, Azure Service Bus, is that we need Azure Service Bus. Actually, that's, that's probably not true. I mean, there's, there's a lot of um, a lot of alternatives out there, um, and to be fair, they do mostly the same thing. Um, I think there's one thing in the talk that I'm going to cover that is unique to Azure Service Bus, but most of the con well, all of the concepts are, are common to pretty much every single uh, service bus, and certainly all of the three major cloud providers. Okay, so um, we've, we've gone on a bit about that. Um, so I should probably talk about what Azure Service Bus is. And the answer to that is it's a message broker. So we um, should probably talk about what a message broker is. Um, so the definition here is that um, a message broker is a, a discrete service. Um, so it, it runs in its own executable. Um, it communicate uh, so clients would communicate with a message broker, not each other. That kind of implied in the name in terms of it's a broker. Um, and typically, um, they have two types of communication. Um, so they have queues. They all have queues. Uh, sorry, they have topics or, or this this concept of pub sub, and and they have queues. I can think of one exception to that with the, the major cloud providers. I think Google only does PubSub. I don't think they have a, a queue offering, although I stand to be corrected on that. Cool. Okay, so um, if we talk about how these services communicate, um, this is a pretty basic little PowerPoint animation. Um, essentially, service one bungs a message on a queue. Um, and service two takes that message off the queue, which means that neither service one nor service two know about each other as such. Um, however, it, you know it's, it's a bit like IOC, so you, you lose your dependency on the thing that you're dependent on, but then you gain a dependency on the abstraction. Um, but you know you can you can sort of abstract your abstraction if you like. Okay, so um, I'm going to use a, a tool called Service Bus Explorer um, in this demo quite a lot. Um, there is a preview of this in the portal, in the Azure portal. Um, it's good, but it's not as good as, as the desktop version. Um, if you're just kind of adding messages to a queue, the, the portal version is fine. Um, but for you know, one or two of the um, Sort of additional features you might need to use a, uh, the desktop version. And the other thing I just wanted to talk about, um, this this was based on a this little slide was based on a blog post I wrote a while ago um, on my frustration of uh, of the of the SDK libraries. So there's currently three SDK libraries that um, that apply to Azure Service Bus. Um, there's this one, uh, Windows Azure dot Service Bus. Um, it's closed source and it's framework only, and it was created in 2011. Um, so obviously, you know, that's kind of not the one to use. And I think you know all, all the others will also work with, with framework. Um, there's Microsoft dot Azure dot Service Bus. So that's open source and it works with .NET Core. It was created in 2017 and it will work fine with 90% of what you want to do. But it was replaced in 2020 with Azure.messaging.service bus. Um, if you think this is confusing, then 
it it is really confusing. Um, Azure dot message messaging dot service bus is also open source and also dot net core compliant, but additionally supports managed identity, and I suppose more importantly, it's the new one. So that's the one that we're going to start updating. However, you can still find docs for the um, you can still find docs for this one knocking about um, Azure's sort of official docs. Um, so there is a question as to you know whether they're going to sort that out. Okay, um, I'll show uh, what the desktop version of Service Bus Explorer looks like just to sort of illustrate what we're going to be doing. Um, so this is Service Bus Explorer. Um, it looks like, a, you know, if you've never seen it, it looks like quite a, a complicated app. It's, it's not, it's relatively simple. Um, you, you connect to your namespace or, you know, you can connect to an individual queue if you so choose. Uh, you get a list of your queues, a list of your topics, a list of your subscriptions. Um, you can go into uh, one of uh, one of the queues, and what we'll do is later we'll sort of go, go further into detail of some of these. But um, you know, you can go in, you can have a look at the messages, um, and you can see the properties on the messages and on the queue, and so on and so forth. You can create queues in here, um, so it's, it's quite a useful tool for, for testing. Cool. Okay, so. Uh, let's talk about queues. Um, so, I mean, almost seems obvious when you say, what is a queue? But, I mean, a queue is a, a set of messages. Um, and broadly, the, the messages are dealt with on a first-in, first-out basis, although on service bus, that's not guaranteed as such. Um, we can have zero, one or more uh, receivers. So, um, this is an interesting differentiator between queues and topics. Um, so a queue can have zero receivers. Um, so to set up a queue, um, you, know, you, you install, I'm, I'm doing this on a CLI, you know, I've, just, I've just showed you the um, Service Bus Explorer, you can do it in Service Bus Explorer, you can do it in the portal, uh, but you can also do it in the, the Azure CLI. Um, so you know you install the CLI if you've not got it installed. Create a resource group, um, a namespace, and then, and then the queue, and add a message to the queue. Um, so I've, I've basically recorded myself uh, downloading this because I thought it would be uh, it would be pointless actually doing it again, especially since I've already got it installed. Um, but essentially, you go to an Azure website, um, you, know, you find the download link, which, uh, which is there. Um, and it'll install the, install the Azure CLI. I'd recommend if you're going to do anything with Azure, you have the Azure CLI installed. Um, and then once you've got it installed, you can do an AZ login. Um, it'll take you to a page like this, and you can basically log in with your Microsoft account, and then you're authenticated. Um, and then you'd want to create a resource group. so. You know, we're gonna we're heading into a series of slides now that just have some uh, some sort of uh, uh, Azure CLI commands in. Um, basically, you know, you can create a group, give it a location and a namespace. Um, uh, you can create your your, uh, your namespace there, um, and then create a queue. Don't delve, delve too much into that. Um, okay, so uh, queues. Let's uh, let's get some code up and and see see how this works. Um, so I've got a demo here. This is all on um, on GitHub. If you if you're kind of interested in running it yourself, run uh, this one. Okay, so. Uh, what this is going to do is it's going to send some messages. When I press one, it's going to send some messages into the uh, into the queue. And what we can do here is we can bring this little tool back, and we can see 
to these messages appear in the queue. Um, and if we click on messages, then we can see that you know these, these are kind of there. Um, and then we can receive one of these. So uh, press three, and it'll receive a message. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to uh, press two, and it's going to receive a number of messages. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring back service bus, uh, the, the explorer, and you see that there's still a hundred messages in the in the queue. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through the code now and, and explain why that's the case. So what we've got, I mean, I'll start with the, the basics of the um, the actual library that we're using. So you know, I mentioned before, azure.messaging.servicebus. Um, version 7.1.2, believe it or not. Um, so basically, all this is doing, this is just a console app. Um, it's getting the connection string um, to the service bus. Um, and then it's setting up this service bus client object. Um, and all all of these examples do basically these these two things. Um, what it's then doing with the, um, just quickly talk about a send message. Um, so with with this new sort of SDK, um, it's got some pretty simple methods. Uh, so you've got effectively anything you want to do, you, you'll create something for it. So you, you know, in, in, if you want to send a message, you create a sender. If you want to receive a message, you create a, a receiver. Um, and then, you know, I think I think it's a hundred messages. It's going through, and it's just creating a message, and then and then calling send async. Um, and then if we have a look at where I've received the message um, directly, so that would be uh, this method here, read message. Um, so what that's doing is it's saying, okay, um, I want to create myself a receiver. Um, you know, as I said, we create based on uh, on what you want to do. So it's creating a receiver, um, and then it and then it kind of receives a message. Um, now you notice this thing that I've uh, I've commented out here. Um, so there's essentially two um, there's two modes that you can receive messages in. One of them is receive and delete, and the other one is uh, peak lock. So what peak lock does, and peak lock is the default. Peak lock allows you to look at the messages but not actually receive them. Um, so it will essentially lock the message for you for a period of time. And then after that time's expired, the message will go back on the queue. So that's why when we looked at our, uh, our queue, there's still 100 messages in it because I'm not actually receiving and deleting them. Um, if, I, if I enable that now and then run it, uh, and then I'll do a, a direct receipt, then we can have a look here, and we should see that drops down to 99, which it does. Um, okay, and then, um, so that there's effectively, you know, you might notice there's two ways of of reading the message. Um, so the first the first way is the way that we've just talked about, where you create a receiver and you receive the message. And it's all kind of in line and, and you wait for the result and then you do something with the result. Um, and the other way is, is based on a, a sort of event principle. Um, now the event principle is a little bit more interesting um, or maybe substitute interesting for complex, but either way. Um, so, so what this does, instead of creating a receiver, it creates what's called a processor. And a processor has a couple of events, um, or you know, uh, yeah, events that occur that you can you can sort of uh, react to. Um, so it's got this process message and then and then an error one. Um, and what essentially happens there is when a message is received, it it executes that handler that we pass it. Um, 
and you'll notice here we've got uh, some options that we passed in. So we've got um, a receive mode, again, the default is peak lock, um, but we've also got this auto complete messages, which is, uh, which is set to false. Um, now there's a difference between the two. Um, the difference is subtle, but it's quite, um, it's quite important. So if you, um, if you receive and delete a message, what that means is that as soon as you take the message off the queue, it's gone. So if you, um, I won't kind of, uh, just go through this because we've got some more demos and running a bit low on time, but if for example, that happened halfway through, um, and you'd done a receive and delete, you would lose that message. It'd be completely gone. Um, whereas, uh, auto complete basically allows, it basically goes through the handler and if it gets to the end and nothing's crashed, it will complete your message for you. Um, of course you can do that yourself manually. So you can essentially do that, which, um, if I just sort out the async business here, um, when that, uh, completes the handler message, you should notice now that I can receive all of them messages and it will update and, and receive the message. So you're probably looking at that and you're thinking, hang on, it was 99 messages and now 85, why did it only receive, uh, what about 10, 15 messages? So that's the other, other thing that I just wanted to show. Um, so unlike the previous, um, the previous SDK, um, what you do with a, a processor on this is you, you essentially say, well, I want to start processing a message and then you tell it, you want to stop processing messages. Um, and as you can see in between, I've got a delay of two seconds. So it basically received as many messages as it could in, in a two second time period. Um, cool. Okay. I think that's, um, I think that's pretty much that. So let's go back to there. Okay. So the next thing is topics. Um, so topics, um, are very, very similar, um, in, in most ways. Um, essentially this is the principle is that you, that didn't show my uh, PowerPoint animation angle. There we go. Um, so <laughs> Took me ages that. Um, so essentially, what what happens with a topic is you um, you broadcast the message, and then anybody that's listening for that message receives that message. Um, what that means is that if you haven't um, subscribed, is the term for listening to that message, then then you won't get it. So, you know, as I said before, you can have zero listeners for a queue. You can't have zero listeners for a topic because you know that. You can send messages to a topic with no subscribers, but it's just lost. Um, so essentially it's multiple independent queues um, based on subscriptions. Um, you can only see messages that you've subscribed to. And, and like I said, you know, unlike a queue, a message that doesn't have a subscriber is lost. It's a bit like that thing, the tree falling in a forest. So if nobody's listening, then um, is it really there? And uh, for a topic, the answer is no. Um, and yeah, so this this was just to, to say that, you know, you broadcast to the topic, but it's actually the subscriptions that receive it. And when you actually start looking at Azure Service Bus, um, a subscription and a queue are pretty much the same in terms of how they're dealt with and referred to all through like the SDK and you know, from, from principle of, of how it behaves, they're, they're almost identical. Okay. So, we, you know, back to the uh, boring slides about, um, Azure CLI, um, this would be how you uh, create a topic. Um, 
and they were a slightly more interesting demo of the topic. Um, so if I go back here, get rid of that, and OK. OK, so we're going to run this again. My stunning UI. Um, I'm available for UI contracting if anybody would like me to reproduce this for your business. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, this is this is a really simple um, sort of demo. So we'll uh, we'll send some messages, and what we'll see is that we've got some messages in our subscription here. Um, and then you know we can receive their messages back um, and here I've, I've changed it a little bit so essentially I've got a start and a stop receiving messages and um, we can just talk a little bit about how that works before I do I should probably just prove that that's actually done something there's no sleight of hand going on so it managed to receive what 30 33 messages um, So if we have a look uh, here, uh, so it starts uh, again for, from sending the message point of view that there isn't a difference between a, a, a queue and a topic. You just give it the topic name instead of the queue name. Um, however, um, from a receipt point of view, you can um, well, I, you know, again, there's actually not much difference from a seat point of view, but I've changed it a little bit. Um, so there we've got, you know, the same the same code that you saw before. The only difference when I created the processor, I gave it a subscription, because um, as we said, a topic essentially needs a subscription. Um, so you have to tell it which subscription to listen on. And then, unlike before, I haven't got um, a sort of start and a start with a delay. I've just basically said, start and then and a separate command is, is to stop just to demonstrate that you can, you, know, you can kind of do it in a different way you can do exactly the same with queues okay uh, go back there okay so that's that's all kind of well and good but how does this solve all the problems that i presented at the start um so in terms of logical coupling well services don't uh, don't need to know the location of other services anymore um, and they won't directly break because data has been changed upstream um, and also you know if, if other services break then uh, that won't affect the, the sort of health of, uh, of your service um, and, and they don't care or know what other services do um, however, it all sounds good, um, but now, as we've said, you know, we've introduced a dependency on service bus that can be abstracted. I mean, there's, there's tools like mass transit and, and service bus and so on that you can, uh, you can use to abstract these type of things, or you can just, you know, use an interface and, and kind of do it yourself. Um, a lot of services don't directly break. So, you know, if you've got, um, an up or downstream service, it, will, it might not directly break, but um, essentially, you know, the, there's there's some element of dependency in terms of there's going to be assumptions made in code that, that might cause it damage. Um, and and whilst you know your service might not care as such what another service does, that thing that, that gets done probably still needs doing. Um, and then how we solve temporal coupling? Well, um, we still have a dependency on a sequence of events because um, you can't really avoid that. But generally speaking, um, separating tasks into logical blocks um, tends away from that. Uh, and also you can you can sort of architect it in, in such a way um, or you probably should, should architect it in such a way that the 
the actual temporal coupling isn't isn't in one place, if you like. Um, so you know the, the the sequence of messages is not kind of known by one service or, or entity, if you like. And how we solve system load well, um, each service collects tasks when it's ready to to process them. Um, so service bus will act as a shock absorber for you. Um, there's there's multiple services that can deal with the same queue or topic, so that means that you know you can essentially spread the load um, across processes or or across machines. And from a user experience point of view, well, this is this is a bit different. We're not kind of solving the problem here. Um, what we're doing is we're saying, well, you can um, you can press a button and it will instantly come back to you. Um, but you know we, we may not have a response. So you know you go place order and, and it might say something like, well, I'll send you an email when your order's placed. Um, but there are situations when you might need a response. Um, so I suppose that brings us on to uh, the subject of uh, of request response. Okay, so um, the the general sort of architecture here is that you um, you'd use a thing called a correlation ID. Um, a correlation the the idea behind a, a correlation ID is that you essentially add a tag to a message, um, and then you know about that tag when it comes back um, so for example here you've got process one and um, there's correlation id there goes over to uh, service one and then correlation uh, correlation id two comes back well it's not interested in that but when correlation id one comes back then it accepts that and and here process uh, process one can create a, a sort of blocking weight to make sure that um, you know it doesn't doesn't do anything until until it receives the re the response. Okay, so um, uh, just to clarify, um, correlation ID is is kind of a term that gets used, um, but you could call it aardvark ID or or anything you want. Um, you know, if it was an order, for example and you passed an order out and then you waited for the order to come back it makes sense to use the order id um so yeah, like i said uh, process one can block and wait um or you know use like a toast and come back and say oh, you, your order is complete now or something like that okay so let's see how uh, correlation ids work Cool. Okay. So we're going to run that, and we're also going to go to the the next question in the poll, um, which will become obvious very very shortly um so we're going to send a message in and the message um and th th that sort of sends a message to the queue um and it's going to sit there and uh, wait for a reply uh, and we can see that message in the queue Uh, there. Okay, so we we can see that you know it's posted a message to the queue, um, and then what we're going to do um, is we're going to uh, launch another instance of this, and we're going to reply to that message. Uh, what done there? Ah, there we go. Right. So essentially, um, I can reply to the message with the uh, with the correlation ID. But before I do, 
uh, what we should do is we should see what people's opinions here are. Oh, okay. So it looks like uh, only two people are correct at the minute. No, no more takers. Still only three people correct. Okay. Um so let's let's see what the right answer is. Uh, so we'll um, copy that and reply to the message and you know, it's asking me what the correlation ID is. Send it back. Oh it turns out that the right answer is is Motred, which um only three people got. It's a shame. Um, and then uh, we can also, um, uh, so if we, if we now uh, do the same thing, but this time uh, we reply, but instead we give it the wrong correlation ID. So that's saying, yeah, okay, I've, that's, that doesn't match. Um, so we can have a look why that is. Um, okay, so, uh, so if we, if we have a look at, we started and we sent the message and we awaited a reply. So we've got a, a method here that executes. Um, essentially I'm using this task completion source just to kind of uh, force it to, to wait um, but what, what that does is it it, um, it sends a message so you know just just as uh, as the previous sort of send messages work um, but in this case we're passing through this correlation ID property which is built into service bus um, but you can pass you know just your own properties um, and then use them if you so choose and there's no real reason not to other than this is kind of there. Um, so if we jump back and then uh, see it reading the message. Uh, so essentially it's just now it's it sent the message um, and then it's just waiting for this reply. So it's, it's created a processor um, and then in the handle message, I've just passed in correlation ID. Um, so there I've I've just passed in the correlation ID um, and in, in the handle message all I'm doing is I'm saying well, does the message have the right correlation ID if it does then um, complete the task effectively and uh, complete the message and, and so on otherwise just say no it's, that's the wrong message uh, cool uh, switch back there. Okay. Um, so you know, there's cases where this is this is a good candidate. Um, uh, so you know, if you've got a, a long running, we're talking specifically about queues here. So uh, when when you want to use a queue for a, a correlated message, then a long running process makes sense. You know, if you're um, if you're going off to go and do some process and then you're going to come back and you need to know where where you were or what called you or whatever it is that makes sense uh, things like sending emails or you know where you've got um uh, scalable consumers so you've got more than one thing dealing with a, a single workload and um, that makes sense um but if you if you're trying to communicate within your system then maybe you'd want to use a, a topic um, and so the question is, can we use topics for request response? Um, and the answer is not in the way that we've done it with queues. And the reason is this. Um, so you've got a client here and, and the client creates a subscription. I mean, you could say both of these are clients effectively, but they both create a subscription to the topic. Um, 
And then this client sends a message to that topic. Um, but both clients received a reply. Um, so the, the sort of answer to this seems to be filters. Um, and there's three types of filters. Um, so there's SQL filters, uh, correlation filters, and Boolean filters. Um, they're a little bit of a misnomer. Um, so SQL filters are not really SQL. They're just SQL-like. So it's like a SQL syntax, if you like, but not actually SQL. Um, correlation filters, you can use other properties of the correlation ID. And a Boolean filter is just a facade over it, a SQL filter. Okay, let's have a look at how correlation IDs would work using topics then. Uh, so we can close that and then jump here. So the start up there. Um, and then um, so we'll run that and um, yeah okay so we've got essentially two subscriptions here we've got these two which are, are both relevant for what we're talking about um, so we'll run that and then we need to run a second instance to, to sort of test this. Oh, okay. Um uh, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna send a message uh no reply here and then uh on the second instance and uh, we'll do exactly what we did before. Apply to the message and then give it this correlation ID. And that, that kind of sends the, the matching reply. Um, and the reason that works, let's have a look at the code first. And then, uh, and then we can see what's actually happened to the, uh, the messages. Um, cool. Okay. So, um, the the first thing to note is we haven't only got a service bus client. Now we've now got a service bus administration client, um, which will become more relevant later. Um, that don't get distracted on this task completion source thing. It's just a way of um essentially forcing sort of event driven uh, or event orientated code if you, if you want to put it that way into a sort of um, linear style um, so so what we're doing um, when we send the message in a way to reply um, similar to, to sort of before we, uh, we're doing a create sender uh, setting a correlation ID as we did before um, and, and we're also setting this, this property of two which is you know another built-in property um, and then it just sends a message uh, but the uh, receive uh, or the read message so we go back there and we have a look at the uh, read message so that's that's a way the same correlation ID um, but what we're doing here is we're saying okay well we're gonna get um, a subscription and um, so we look for uh, the specific uh, subscription and then basically we're just gonna get rid of, of the subscription that we might already have and then we're gonna create a new subscription um, and this new subscription and, and so just 
just to step back a minute, this admin claim, which we first saw up here, the service bus administration claim, that's how we're doing this. It's a separate um, separate object. Um, so we're creating a new subscription here. Um, and the new subscription, it obviously needs the topic and the subscription that, that it's actually, so, you know, the topic it's subscribed to and its own name. Um, and then what we've done here is we've created a rule, um, which is essentially the filter that we talked about. This is a correlation filter. So we've said, we're going to set the filter. We're going to say it's a correlation rule filter. Um, and we can we can give it a lot of different properties here. So you know, I pick correlation ID. There are other um, there are other options. Um, so you know, we've got two there, subject, whatever. Um, but it allows you to basically filter these these properties as as messages come in. Um, and then all all I've done there now, I've said, um, okay, we're going to create a, a processor. We'll handle it um, with the, the correlation ID, um, but everything that comes into it will now match because of the filter. Uh, in fact, so that correlation ID is redundant and should have been deleted when I was uh, when I was writing this, which I obviously forgot to do. Um, let's have a quick look at what that um, that subscription looks like now. Um, so here we've got this uh there you see we've got this um this rule that we created as part of that code and um, so the rule call only to me and um, so it'll only respond to this this correlation id and um, and there's there's the filter that's built into it so it'll only you know the, these are uh, the sort of filter properties if you like Okay, and um, let's jump back to that. Okay, so um, sessions. So that's kind of all very well, but it, it did seem a little bit um, involved for what we were talking about. Um, so there's a lot of kind of manual messing about and so on. Um, and this is, you know, at the start when I was sort of saying, well, Microsoft, there's very few of these features that only Microsoft do. Well, sessions is, is one of them. As far as I know, only Azure Service Bus support sessions as such. Um, they're designed for a request response pattern. Um, and it's guaranteed to be first in, first out. Um, but you pay a price for this, so um, you have to pick, uh, well, you pay an actual price and a, a sort of technical price. So you have to pick if your uh, queue is, is session aware. Um, and also, this isn't available on the basic tier, so that's how you kind of pay your actual price. Um, and the way it works is, so you've got, you know, got five messages in, they're strewn across two separate sessions. Um, what happens is it creates a virtual queue for each session um, behind the scenes so you don't have to kind of worry about it, which is, I suppose, if you think about it, what we did artificially with the correlation IDs. Um, so if you want to create a session-enabled queue, um, then you can do it like this. Um, again, you know, can't mix sessions and non-sessions. Non so let's see how that works in uh, in code. Um, right, where are we? Uh, Q session demo. Set style. Okay, so let's have a look at this so we start off um we'll send some messages and while we're doing that we'll just move the uh poll on a little bit got a quiz coming up on uh, on the 
the title of the song. Um, right, okay, so I've just sent those messages to the uh, the service boss. Um, so we should be able to see them. If we have a look here. Um, so yeah, we've got a message there and we've got another message and that's called noise message. Um, so this is just to sort of illustrate that, you know, there are other uses for sessions other than the request response thing. Um, so if we now receive um, receive messages, number two, essentially that's only receiving messages on session one. Um, and so if I, if I refresh that, we can see that one of, one of those messages has been consumed. Um, but the noise message is left, um, and I think, yeah, okay. So there you can see, you know, it's uh, session, yeah, session ID session two. So it it consumed session one, but it left session two. Um, cool. Okay. Um, and then if we. Now launch a second instance of that. Sorry, I just had a brain fart then. I couldn't remember where debug was. Um, right, okay. Um, so that's the second instance. Uh, so it, in the first instance, what we're going to do is we're going to send a a message and wait a reply. Okay, and uh, instance two, we're going to receive that message. Okay, so we've got um, we've got some lyrics here from a song. Um, now let's see if there's anybody knows what that song is. I'll just move this out of the way so you can still see the lyrics. I feel like people are just clicking anything at this stage. <laughs> okay, we've obviously not got many Pink Floyd fans here. Um, that was in fact a, a song written by Roger Waters about Sid Barrett. Um, while we're messing about it, it's like it's timed out. <laughs> um, is it? I'm not sure what's happened there. Yeah, it's timed out. Okay. Um, So, uh, kill that. That's interesting. I'm not sure what that's now going to do to the, uh, the messages. So it is possible that this is the demo that I was talking about at the start when I said the uh, you know stuff goes wrong occasionally. Let's let's see how it works, or if it works. Okay, so uh, we're going to send that message as we did before. We're going to receive it here as we did before. Yep, okay, that's come through. And then uh, we're going to reply on this. And yep, that's uh, so that's replied. And, uh, and yeah, the answer was, uh, was Pink Floyd. Not November Rain, it's five people who responded thought. I'm impressed that two people here have actually heard of the band Blackmore's Night. Okay, cool. Um, so let's see what um, how this kind of works. Um, so. Yeah, there we go. So. Um, 
to start by sending the message. Um, so here is a the, you know a similar sort of process. So it, it sends a message as it did um, before. So it creates a sender, uh, creates a new message, you know, as it did before, um, and then sets the session ID, which essentially is what differentiates that from any other session id and then and then to read the message it is slightly different because what we do here is instead of um instead of creating a, a sort of receiver or whatever it it actually creates a session uh, session receiver and then you give it the session um and then you can ask it to receive a message but it'll only receive on that session um and then what we did for the uh, the sort of request response, we said, okay, we're going to send a message, um, and we're going to pass it uh, a session ID as um, you know as before. So we pass the session ID through, um, and then we're going to we're going to do it on this this session called session one send, and then here we're going to wait for a, a reply on session two reply. Um, and then when we uh, sort of go to the other session, we're going to read that message on session one send. So that's where the um, that's where the message came through. Um, and then we send the reply back on session two reply. So essentially, like I said, we effectively got two uh, two queues or two virtual queues. Cool. Okay. Uh, Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty much it. I think I've got one one little demo left, and we're more or less to time. Um, so other advanced features, um, managed identity, probably not exactly an advanced feature, but you know it's it's a feature that's present in the new Service Bus SDK. Um, that means that you can, uh, so you know instead of using a connection string, you can you can use the um, Whatever it is, new default Azure credential or whatever to to kind of authenticate yourself, and that'll um, that'll be a, a more or supposed to be a, a slicker experience when you when you're kind of developing, and, and also when you deploy, it's a little bit more secure. Um, dead letter queues, and again, this is just what happens when things go wrong. So if if a message can't be delivered or it gets rejected or it's timed out or whatever, that gets dead lettered. Um, you can defer messages, and um, so you can essentially say, "I don't want to receive this message just yet. I want you to sort of give it me back at a later date." Um, you can automatically send messages between queues and topics and so on. Um, you can schedule the message to be delivered at a later date, um, and that's that's in fact the last demo I've got. Um, so let's just quickly. Uh, have a look at that. It should take literally a second because it's a very simple demo. Um, so we run that up. Um, this time we're going to do the opposite. So I'm going to tell it to receive messages first and then I'm going to send the message to it. Um, so that's now registered in Message Handler. Um, and now I'm going to tell it to send a message and remember this is a, a scheduled message so it won't happen immediately so I'm going to keep on talking until eventually you know, the message pops up um, so yeah it said there you know you won't get this message until 10 seconds after um, so there you know it's at 45 and you wouldn't get it until 55 um, and if we have a quick look at the code for that, again, not not particularly rocket science, but um, I won't show the read message again because it's the same. But um, the send scheduled message. So all this basically does is it says create a sender, um, same as before, create a message. But then there's a method called schedule message, and um, that gives you back a sequence number. Um, so if at any point between the time when you schedule a message and the time it gets sent, you want to cancel it, you'll need that sequence number. 
otherwise it's uh, you know, it will get sent. And I think that's it. So um, in summary, um, you can use your message broker to separate services, processes. Um, you can use correlation ID for, for longer running processes um, or, or any other field really um, to, to sort of implement this request response. Um, but with sessions, you can, um, you know, you can almost replace a sort of API request response pattern with a, a sort of session and, uh, and do do that sort of pattern, but via service bus. Okay, well, thanks for listening. Um, the code is at this uh, GitHub uh, repository. And if you want to speak to me outside of this meeting, you can do so on Twitter.